All right, guys, welcome back to the training center here at Counterintelligence in Tempe, Arizona. Things are a little calmer today in the shop. Uh, we had three exciting new trainees last week. They're dealers all over the country. We got one in Alaska, one in Idaho, and one in Utah through our program last week. So we're really excited to get those guys home and operational. We did a little demonstration for you guys last week with our new switchblade technique, but there was a lot going on in the shop that day and I wanted to take uh, a moment and just do it again where I have a little bit more time just to talk to you as the audience at home and uh, take a little bit more time and in a little bit more detail and explain to you exactly how we do things. So we're going to start off. This is going to remind you a lot of our hand marble technique that you've seen so many times. And we get a lot of comments about how much people like the hand marble technique and that it looks cool and it looks natural. This technique mimics that. So you may ask, well, then why are you doing a different technique? Because one of the beautiful things about the hand marble technique is just how simple it is and how easy it is for anybody to do and make look good. Well, this, has a little bit of a different twist as far as the effect and the look that you'll get. When we do the hand marble, when I drag my hand through the countertop, I'm shoving epoxy out of the way. So more epoxy is coming in behind my hand and filling in that space. Well, with this switchblade technique, I'm using a 10 inch wide putty knife and I'm changing the angle of it so I'm widening it and thinning it out but I'm using very light pressure, pretty much no pressure, and it's laying colors on top of other colors. So when I hit it with the isopropyl at the end, we get a lot of webbing with this technique. So they're similar looks, but you're gonna get a lot more webbing after the isopropyl with this technique versus the hand marble. So we started out this recipe with some white, some liquid white, and then this is our sterling, which is a metallic. Once again, with this technique, you wanna be as random as you possibly can with how you apply this color. All right, so we're gonna move on. We're moving on to our code blue. This is another metallic color. You, you know that I don't like to overdo metallics on these because if you get too many metallics, your colors don't stay defined and they don't stay rich. But this code blue is a very nice color. I've also added a little bit of sparkle to both the code blue and the sterling with this piece. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a few pretty good size blue spots in this piece. And then I'm gonna do some smaller spots of blue. I'm gonna take my stick and just, just kind of drip it. Just want a little hint of that blue shining through in a few different places. Again, just trying to be as random as I can possibly be and we'll get the results that we want. All right, so that brings me to my last color, which is black. Now you'll notice this one, I didn't follow that recipe that you normally hear me say, I wanna go dark to light, except for my black. I always say black for last. It's not critical that you follow those steps, but depending on exactly what you're going for, if I wanted white to really be a strong, strong, strong color in this countertop, I would want to add it late. I would want to add it last. But uh, the white, I really want this to be gray. So that white is going to mix with the sterling. It's going to mix with this little bit of black I put in here. So the overall theme of this is going to be gray. If I wanted it to be more white, I would have put the white on last. So I'm not going to overwork this product. So it would have helped the white stay a little bit more prominently white. But since I don't really want it to be just white shining in my face, I put it on first. You can slightly change and manipulate the outcome of your project just by the order in which you apply your colors for different techniques. Some techniques it works, some techniques it doesn't. So just like kind of with the code, with the black, I always, if I'm gonna pour bigger spots of my black, I always wanna make sure that I'm pouring it inside of other colors. I don't want to pour a heavy spot of black onto my dry primer. It just, um, it doesn't lead to really good outcomes. So we're gonna put another decent one right there. And then I'm just gonna put a few drips out here. 
not going to overdo it, but that little bit of black goes a long way when it's working in with all those other colors. Okay. Perfect. Okay. We'll set our epoxy back down. Now, with this being a relatively new technique, as far as our five techniques go, we, we've switched the old switchblade to this technique. I'm still playing around with my favorite way of doing the initial spread. So if you prefer to use your hands on the initial spread, I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, but personally, I like to take the blade and make as few amount of passes as I can to spread this out. I'm not worried about creating a beautiful pattern. I don't, if I want my, my grain to go this way, I don't want to be taking my putty knife directly perpendicular to the angle in which I'm going to try to manipulate these colors for my finished product. But outside of that, if I just want to be kind of almost like a typewriter to spread this out, that's going to be perfectly fine. But this gives me a 10 inch wide um, surface. It does make it pretty fast. So that's what I'm sticking with for now is my preferred method. I may change that as we move forward. This is just like epoxy. This is a fluid thing. As we change, as we evolve, as we're trying to keep things as simple as possible. If I figure out a better way, then I'll be bringing it to you on another video. So I'm just gonna make some passes here. Not really caring exactly what this looks like right at this particular moment because we're still going to manipulate this. I just want to make sure that I don't have any spots that are super thin and I don't want to have to overwork this product. The more I work this product, the less defined these colors will stay whenever I try to manipulate them with my blade to get the design that I want. Also, don't move too fast. Allow the epoxy a little bit of time. Got a burr in there. Allow the epoxy just a little bit of, a, of time to move underneath of that blade and spread out. Give it a chance. It'll do most of the work for you if you let it. I looked a little bit thin down on this corner. I'm gonna re hit this. Oh, that's looking pretty decent now. Okay. So now I've got my surface pretty well covered. I want to, before I start trying to put my pattern into the top, I wanna to go ahead, take my gloved hand, and all this stuff that's dripping down this face. I want to go ahead and get a nice even coat lathered onto the face of my countertop because as this epoxy moves, I need it to continue to flow evenly down this face. You may have spots on your faces that are already looking good but I promise you those faces are gonna move so much more. It's way more important at this point to make sure that you have enough product on the face versus exactly what the pattern looks like at this point. Okay, so I'm gonna lay my blade down for just a second. I'm gonna peel off my second glove just so I don't make a huge mess. Now, I want to start creating my pattern. I've already got this side of my blade is lubricated, so I'm gonna stick with that. I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna always start out on your edges and I'm going to use light pressure to no pressure and just try to kind of as randomly as I possibly can, just create some 
very cool effects. It's okay if it skips a little bit. It's okay if, it, if you get some waves. You just want a little bit of everything with this technique. You don't want it to get super patterned. You want some skinny spots. You want some thick spots. You want to overlap a little bit. So just because I've already run through a certain area doesn't mean I have to avoid that area because it will look like layer upon layer as you don't hit every single square inch with each pass. So don't be scared. If a spot's looking good, go ahead and, and run over it again. I don't want you to run over the same spot 58 times, but it's going to help it have some, some nice realism if you do a few layers. And I've got a real thin spot of epoxy that I'm not liking. So I'm gonna come out here, drop off a little bit of epoxy, and I'm gonna just retake that blade through that area just to make sure that that's looking good. And I've got a hard black spot. I probably should have had you focus in on that just to show people what I'm talking about, about putting that black down when it hits primer versus when you put it down in, inside of other epoxy, it's already on the, the countertop. So we're gonna start here. We, we just want to kind of, I'm definitely overlapping a little bit into my, my other swipes that I made from the other side of the countertop. Like I said, you don't want to create too much of a pattern. Sometimes it's very difficult not to have some sort of a pattern. And right here, I've got a little bit of an issue because I used black. I'm going to get a little bit of white that I had left in my bucket. And I'm going to try to really press that black is down on our primer. And let's see if I can get a little bit more color in there. Now I'm just going to re-manipulate that. So it flows in and I got rid of that hard black line that looked like a black drip in my countertop because I didn't like that. So you can see, Chris, as I drug that blade, I missed some areas and that's cool. So I don't have to just go to that area so I can stop here. I can overlap a little bit, hit that area, miss a little bit, put a few little waves in there. Kind of you don't have to just avoid everything that you've already hit just because it may look good because the more layers that you do as long as you don't overwork it it's just going to add to the realism and it's going to look really 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 cool when it's done this technique is actually a lot of fun to do and this color combo gets you some pretty neat cool looking stuff as well The overhead view is probably the most educational view for this technique. And I got something in here that's like orange. I don't know where that came from, but we got some foreign debris from somewhere. Well, I just had to remove some of my epoxy. So again, I'm going to replace it. This spot down here has just kind of been a little bit of a pain for me on this piece, but we're going we're gonna to make it work. We're going to make it work. Okay. Looking for any kind of trouble spots that I don't like. This definitely hasn't been worked yet. So again, I'm going to kind of come over here, start on the edge and try to make something really neat and cool. You see how I turned the blade almost straight on and it just created a completely different kind of look through there. If you don't like it, all you got to do is come back in and hit it again. It's really whatever you want. You have a lot of creative freedom with this technique. I think I kind of want to try to create something pretty defined running through here. So I'm going to run kind of thin, almost going to create some type of a vein running this way through here. Okay. One thing that you definitely want to avoid, and Chris, I'll let you kind of zoom in a little bit close on this, is coming out here and just laying your blade down in the middle of the countertop because now I've got a perfectly straight line from where I laid that down. You always kind of want to come to your, to your edges 
and work in to the countertop, not starting just right there dead in the center because it's gonna create some very awkward looking places in your countertop piece. Okay, liking this pretty good. Um, just gonna lay that down, give my hands a quick wipe. We're gonna hit this with some isopropyl alcohol. You're gonna see this thing really come to life uh, in this technique. With such light amount of pressure that we use on this technique, you're gonna see a lot more selling or webbing or whatever, whatever terminology you wanna call it. I call it webbing um, with this technique versus our hand marble. You're just gonna see a lot. And it always looks that way when you first start, but after the isopropyl settles out, you're really gonna maintain a lot of that webbing characteristics with this technique. And it is absolutely amazing at how this kind of looks like rubbish. And then once we hit this with the isopropyl and it starts to evaporate, just how cool this technique starts to turn out. And obviously you can kind of control the colors and stuff with this technique if I wanted harder spots of, of black or harder spots of blue, I can, I can control that with the way that I pour my colors. So if I wanted there to be far more blue on this side and hardly any blue on that side, I can control that with the way that I apply my colored epoxy before we start spreading it out. We just want to make sure we get a good lather. We don't want to flood this out. Flooding out it just means you've put in too much isopropyl on there. So you, you essentially lose all of the effect of the isopropyl if you overdo it. So we want a good lather, but we just don't want to do too much. This thing actually looks a little bit busy to me because I was showing you multiple different ways of, of running that blade through. In my opinion, this is overworked just a little bit, but I want to show you even at this point, Let's just say that I don't like the way that this looks. I can come back in here, make me a new pass. I like that. Rehit this with isopropyl in the areas that I repassed it. And I can kind of change it and manipulate it and kind of get it looking more like what I'm going for. Again, be careful that you don't do too much because the more you do, the more these are gonna kind of bleed together and create what we call a muddy look. So you're not gonna have as defined a color characteristics throughout your piece. This is really black. I wish I had some more blue over here. I don't really have any more blue to add to it, but you could if you had any leftover um, but that all just kind of has to do with how we added our colors. I am going to take this and see if I can make this look a little bit cooler. I think I might be able to. Just trying to kind of create something that looks a little more dynamic. This technique really, I'm not going to say it requires practice because they always turn out looking good. It's kind of like hand marble. You can't really mess it up. Now, can one piece look better than the next? Can one piece look more expensive than the next? Absolutely. And it's really just about you getting the blade in your hand, manipulating the epoxy, learn how it works, making sure that you don't get thin spots. When you turn this blade, that's where you're going to have a tendency if you've got too much pressure on it at all, you're going to get these thin spots that even though this is a self-leveling epoxy, it does have limitations. If you sh scrape it all the way down to the primer, you're going to have a hard time getting it to fill back in all the way as it would if it just had a dimple in it or something like that. So it just requires a little bit of practice and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. You can create some really cool pieces with this. You're going to see a lot more of these. Uh, we're still kind of playing around with different recipes that we like because recipes is very important to the outcome of, of your pieces. 
This is a recipe. I did this color for the class on a sample board last week. It actually went out as one of our shorts last week and I liked it a lot better on the sample board than I do on this one, but I learned a little bit as far as how I want to lay out the color. This one has a little bit too much blue in it. And I like the blue in it, but it's got too much blue in it. So you got to adjust those recipes. But um, just like usual, you just have to learn the product, play with it a little bit, get familiar with your tools and how they work together. And just like always, we'll catch you on the next one.